Hello and welcome everyone. Uh, we are going to officially start tonight's webinar, Exploring Fungi, Mushrooms of North Central Massachusetts, presented by David Babik. So my name is Maria Elena Lima and I'm the Communications and Engagement Coordinator for Mount Graceland Conservation Trust. Thank you all for joining us. I'll be moderating tonight's webinar. Uh, before I introduce our naturalists for the evening, I'd like to just take a minute or two uh, to speak about Mount Graceland Conservation Trust, uh, if you're not familiar with uh, our organization. So we are an innovative and collaborative regional land trust that has been conserving the open spaces and local farms that are important to our communities in North Central Massachusetts since 1986. So we are coming up to 35 years total. Um, as I spoke with David Babik when planning this webinar, he actually shared one of his favorite hunting spots for mushrooms in our region, which was our very own Arthur Iverson Conservation Area in Warwick. And uh, one thing I'm happy to share is that uh, we recently conserved Earl Acres, which is about a 50 acre parcel of woods and wetlands in the center of this conservation area. So now the conservation area is about 600 acres of beautiful brooks, uh, wetlands, and prime habitat for th threatened birds and plants. Um, as, and so that will forever be protected and enjoyed by mushroom enthusiasts like yourself. So, and not to interrupt you, but the last time I was there, I got really worried that it was being developed because I hit the patch where all the trees were cut down. And then I read on your website that that was to the advantage of birds that like younger growth forests to create a patch of younger growth forests. So I'm encouraged that they're not building condos or something, but I got really scared when I saw that section. Yes, so now we have 600, almost 600 acres of totally conserved uh, land in Warwick. Um, and so for any of you who are watching and are, and are Mount Grace members, I'd like to thank you for your continued support of our work. Um, we couldn't have conserved the almost 35,000 acres of land that we have without the support of our members. And so if you're not a member, I would encourage you to consider joining Mount Grace um, if it's within your means at this time. New members allow Mount Grace to grow and accelerate the pace of land protection in our region. Uh, by supporting Mount Grace, we can hold more events like this, as well as continue to teach youth in our environmental education program um, and protect our small New England farms from development. So with that said, your support will help ensure that we always have clean air and drinking water, great places to get outdoors, especially in the time of COVID and fresh local food. So without further ado, I'll introduce our naturalist for the evening, David Babik. He's a member of the Boston Mycological Club's ID committee and the current foray coordinator. He's also a member of the Monadnock Mushroomers Unlimited, a group that often holds walks and events in the Athol area. Uh, David has regularly searched for fungi in northern Massachusetts and, northern, uh, and southern New Hampshire, and he's very familiar with the types of mushrooms you may run across. And he's very excited to share everything he knows with you. So let's get started. Okay, great. So I, I want to thank you all for coming tonight. And I also want to say that I have um, never done a webinar on Zoom before. I've done lots of Zoom meetings. I've taught lots of mushroom classes. But if anything goes wrong, I'm blaming Mari. Um, but ho hopefully this all goes smoothly. And um, I'm going to, in a minute, just start sharing some slides with you. But I, you know, I just want to give you a little little sense of where I'm coming from. When when I was a kid, I used to uh, go with my father mushroom hunting. He was from Poland, and and he didn't speak a lot of English. And I really just enjoyed going out in the woods with him. I never really tried to learn what he was doing, but he knew an awful lot about mushrooms. And I would just find stuff and bring it up to him, and he would cut it off at the stem, touch it to his tongue, and either throw it over his shoulder or put it in his basket. And so I never quite knew what he was doing or why he was doing it. And I really never found out. And years later, about probably about 40 years later, I was camping with friends at um, Tully Lake up in Royalston. And I saw these beautiful big mushrooms. And all I could think of was these are the kind of mushrooms I used to always find with my father. So I brought them back to the campsite. I said, guys, I'm going to cook these up. We're going to, these are good mushrooms. I know it. And they were all like, no, don't do it. You're going to die. You're crazy. And next thing I knew, they had the ranger over there, and the ranger and his friend were telling me, oh, we had a guy that thought he knew mushrooms and ended up in the hospital 
you better not eat those. You, you could be risking your life. So I said, all right, I threw them back in the woods and decided I was going to go and buy a book and learn how to identify mushrooms. So one, once I bought a book, I learned that there's just thousands and thousands of mushrooms in our area and countless numbers of them haven't even ever been identified correctly yet. And so it's, it's virtually impossible to know them all. But so with that as a starting point, I said, well, I guess the starting point and where most people start is you learn the easiest ones to identify. And you wanna first learn the really good edible mushrooms that you can't mistake for anything else. And you also wanna learn a, a, a few mushrooms that will kill you right away if you mess up and eat them. And so you wanna make sure you avoid those and know what they look like. And you wanna make sure you learn the ones that are very easy to identify. And that's a great starting point. And so each year you can try to learn a few more, but you know, once I discovered how big a job it was gonna to be to actually learn how to identify these mushrooms, I, I joined the Boston Mycological Club, which has been around for over 100 years. They started in, I think, 1898. And um, I joined their ID committee and, and just volunteered to come along and help with all the walks and, and just learn from the older guys in the club that knew things. And they were all at the verge of kind of fading out of the club. So it was, you know, at a good time to get into it because before long they had all kind of retired or moved on or stopped going out in the woods because they were getting too old. And so, you know, a few of us have taken over leading the walks and, and taking people out in the woods. So the Boston club, we go out every Sunday. Um, the Monadnock club is a very small club that kind of is centered in Southern New Hampshire and up in the Athol area. And they're, they're in a state of flux because the main person leading the club, their president, just moved out of state. So they're trying to restructure the club and figure out how to deal with walks. This year, nobody's really doing any organized walks because of COVID. And it's just too hard to have a lot of people cluster around a table to look at mushrooms. So without, without being a dead horse about who I am, let me, uh, let me try getting my screen share up and we can try this slideshow. All right, so I, you know, my focus today is just mushrooms that are in North Central Mass. It's, they're not a lot different than the rest of the state or you know, New Hampshire or Vermont for that matter. But you know, I tried to focus on pictures of things that I found in the kind of Athol, Athol and Southern New Hampshire area and over to Fitchburg. We ran a, a big convention out of Fitchburg a few years ago and uh, it was the only summer that was as dry as this one. So we had about 300 people out in the woods hunting for mushrooms and it was terribly dry. So one thing to keep in mind is that mushrooms are really very sensitive to the moisture level. So on a summer like this, where we have severe drought, it's really hard. There's mushrooms out there, but there's not a lot. And the big fleshy mushrooms are very hard to find. Um, and also, you know, a lot of mushrooms look very similar. Like the two mushrooms pictured here on the right and the left are, really completely different mushrooms, but they, from at first blush, they look pretty similar. These are trooping fuzzy foots on the left, which grow in big clusters on wood, and over on the right are some golden chanterelles. But we'll talk about individual mushrooms in a few, but let's, let's get started. So just, just the basic idea of what a mushroom is. Um, you know, we think of a mushroom as like what you get in the grocery store, the little button mushroom, or, or, uh, you know, or maybe the porcinis or morels. But the mushroom itself is really a big organism that's either in wood or under the soil. It's almost like a giant web. And the, the fungal web or the mycelium spreads and lives for decades and decades sometimes. In fact, one of the largest living organisms in the world is out in, I think, Seattle or Washington. It's something like 300 acres in size, this one mushroom. And um, it's a honey mushroom which is the one I show in the center there. And it's just a massive structure. But the thing we think of as a mushroom is just the fruiting body. And it's kind of like an apple on an apple tree. So it's something that comes and goes. It's very seasonal and very temporary, but the actual organism itself lives on much, much longer. Um, what, you know, what do mushrooms actually do in the environment? The mushrooms can kind of be broken down into three groups. One is the saprobic mushrooms that a decayed dead organic matter. The one I showed down below, the cup fungi, is a type of mushroom you'll find in the spring growing on wood chips mainly and uh, in duff and things like that. And it decays old dead material. Then you have parasitic mushrooms that will kill living organisms, usually attacking trees 
Um, the honey mushrooms that are in the center, which come out usually about mid-September, can come up in the thousands, but they do kill the trees they're attacking and they spread from tree to tree. So they're a dangerous mushroom that can really do a lot of damage. And then there's a very large family, and many of the edibles are in this family of symbiotic type of mushrooms that they coexist with trees and they exchange nutrients back and forth. And knowing the type of tree they're related with will often help you to find that type of mushroom. When you, when you try to identify a mushroom, the more data you can collect, the better. Um, on the left, on the right here, I have a picture of what I do when I collect the mushroom. I take some pictures with a camera with my phone and put them on the paper with a, a drawing and up in the corner I have a spore print. A spore print is really, really important to identifying mushrooms when you're starting out. And you can see in the, in the top center of the screen in the circle there, this is a spore print I took of a mushroom. And to take a spore print is very simple, but it will give you a lot of relevant information about what the mushroom is because you're actually seeing the color of its spores. So you would cut the mushroom off at the top of the stem or the stipe so it can stand upright and just put it gill side down so the, the cap is facing up on top of a piece of paper. I usually use paper that's half white or half black because you never know what color the spores would be. Put a bowl over it and anywhere between two hours and 24 hours, depending on how moist and active it is, you're gonna get a print on the paper like this. And that print will show you what color the mushroom is. So in this case, I was come across, came across a mushroom I didn't know. So I took all kinds of information about it, where I found it, what the weather conditions were like, what it was growing on. Was it growing in soil? Was it growing on wood? The dimensions, um, I looked at the gills underneath and. Every, every descriptive thing I could think about, I tasted it, I smelled it. Um, when I say taste, it's okay to taste any mushroom you find, but you can't swallow it. You wanna just taste a little bit on the tip of your tongue and spit it out. Um, and that will all, often help you figure out what it is. Some mushrooms have a bitter taste, some, some have a hot or spicy taste. So um, it really will give you a little bit of information. But a spore print is very important in identifying mushrooms. Other things you wanna think about, our mushrooms change a lot when they grow. Um, the colorful mushrooms down on the left there, this is, this is a picture of Jack, Amanita jacksonii. And I collected these up at Mount Monadnock uh, last summer, actually no, two summers ago. And it shows you how this particular mushroom develops because there's a lot of them there. So I get to put this picture together. On the far right in the lower corner, this is how it starts out. It's a, it's a kind of white ball um, kind of fuzzy looking, and then the orange mushroom starts to emerge out of this egg or, or volatile sac, and it comes up like this. When the mushroom's young, the cap's usually closed like this, and then as it ages, it starts to open. Eventually, it flattens out, sometimes even upturns, and uh, you know, here's some older ones over here that look like fried eggs in the background, but um, this shows you all the different looks a single mushroom can have, and over on the right, this bolete. At the top, this is a spotted bolete when it's very young. When they're young, it's like a chocolate brown color with these tiny beige spots over it. But right next to it was this older one that looks completely different. The color changes this much in a matter of a couple days as the mushroom matures. So sometimes, you know, getting an idea on a mushroom may really depend on finding two or three examples around one younger, one older, so you can get a sense of how they change over time. Deciding what the spore producing surface is like will help you to figure out what, what type of mushroom you have also because um, what's underneath the cap is very important to identifying a mushroom. This is a mushroom that obviously has gills or these uh, flat plates um, and the type of gills that a mushroom has will help you identify. These are very sinuous. They move up and down. They're not straight across and uh, they, they tend to be fairly widely spaced. Sometimes they're much closer together. These all help you figure out what you have. Other mushrooms have pores on the bottom and the, the pores are common to a family called boletes, which is a lot of good edibles in the family of boletes. And they look almost like a sponge. And especially when they're young, the pores are very, very closely spaced and, and just look like a solid white sponge sometimes. Um, there's a lot of different kinds of boletes in our woods. And, in the rainier weather, they're very common. 
Um, one thing is that if you're uh, collecting mushrooms for the table that you want to later on try to eat, the, uh, the bolides tend to get hit by bugs really quickly. So it's hard to find them young enough where they're clean and no insects have attacked them and chewed on them yet. But um, in the fall, it's much easier when the temperatures get a little more cool. When you're collecting mushrooms to figure out what kind you have, finding the entire mushroom is really important. Um, here's a couple of mushrooms that are similar type mushrooms. And if you were to cut them off at the stem, all you'd have is kind of a yellow orange stem and that orange cap. And you might think they were the same mushroom, but collecting the whole base of the mushroom allows you to see they're actually very different. This one has a yellow rounded bulb for a base where this one has a white almost cottony sack underneath it. So they're very different mushrooms. And it's important to make these distinctions because this mushroom is one that is very poisonous. It's a Flaviconia, Amanita flaviconia, where this one, Amanita jacksonia, is actually an edible mushroom. So um, it's important to collect an entire mushroom when you collect something to identify it. You also want to pay attention to the location. Where was it growing? Was it growing on soil? Was it growing on wood? Um, take some photos because you'll forget or take some notes. Um, also, the smell of the mushroom, the taste of the mushroom is important to notice and what type of trees are around it. And it doesn't have to be the tree that's right next to the mushroom. It could be a tree that's 50 feet away. Usually the height of a tree is how far its root system stretches out. So um, a mushroom could be anywhere under this tree and doesn't need to be right near the base to be associated with the tree. So before we start about some of the more common edible mushrooms you can run across in our, in our woods here up in Northern Massachusetts, a couple words of warning. One, consuming wild mushrooms can lead to death. Be really careful. You don't want to be adventurous and just try things. You want to be sure of anything you're going to consume. Um, if you prefer not to die or spend days in the bathroom, you really need to be careful. Um, also, wild mushrooms should never be eaten raw. They should always be cooked thoroughly. A lot of mushrooms have very mild toxins in them that are dissipated by heat, um, but raw would really do damage to you. Um, like I said earlier, you want to learn to identify the, the easiest to identify edible and the easiest to identify toxic mushrooms. You want to learn about what mushrooms look similar to the ones you're looking for. And it's great if you can join a club or connect with somebody that really knows what they're doing to go out in the woods. Um, but that's a few words of warning because you really want to take this very seriously. If you're going to try collecting wild mushrooms to eat, you need to be sure of what you've collected. Mushrooms are really seasonal. Here's, here's a, a collection of different types of mushrooms you're likely to find in the spring. Um, in the center of the picture up on the top here, these are something called wine caps. Wine caps are really easy to identify. And uh, they're, they're a delicious mushroom that comes out early in the spring. They usually will be found the day after a heavy rain on wood chips. And they show up a lot in mulch beds. You don't have to go out into the deep woods to find them. And they have usually they have this really maroon cap. Occasionally there's a, a different form that has kind of a golden cap on it. But the, uh, the typical wine cap has this burgundy wine colored cap. And they also have gills that kind of, uh, it's a ring around the stem. I mean, that kind of looks like a cod. It has chunks to it as the ring goes around the stem. And rings on the stem are also very helpful in diagn diagnostic uh, information. The gills are kind of a purplish color. The spore print is dark purple. So it all has that wine related theme, but you can find an awful lot of these in the spring. Um, up here in the, up in the little rounded thing up in the uh, upper right is a cup fungi. They show up a lot in the spring. They're generally not edible, but they can be very colorful. Um, also morels, people get very excited about morels. Here's some black morels, some golden morels, some half morels. Um, they, they all come out mainly in the springtime. They tend to uh, show up on areas with old elm trees or old ash trees, which are really a symbiotic kind of tree for these type of mushrooms. Um, they're very poisonous if you eat them wrong, but they're completely fine if you cook them thoroughly. Um, some mushrooms are very short-lived, like these up in the upper left-hand corner are something called the Japanese umbrella inky mushroom. And they show up after, after evening rain, they'll show up the next morning at dawn and by 10 o'clock they've disappeared. Um, but they're a beautiful little mushroom we often see early in the morning. 
there's in our climate there's not a ton of spring mushrooms that come out but there are a handful of good edible mushrooms once you get into the summer there's a lot more mushrooms especially if it's a wet summer people in, in mushroom hunting groups still talk about 2018 we had a ton of rain that summer and there were more mushrooms than anybody's ever seen they were everywhere um, we probably had 200 new members join our club that year because people were so excited about all the mushrooms they were seeing. So here's, here's just a sampling of a few of the things I want to talk about in some of the summer mushrooms. Um, this orange thing down in the lower, lower part, the Lytoporus, is something that's commonly called chicken of the woods. This is one of the mushrooms that most beginners start off with because it's so easy to identify and you can find so much of it if you're lucky. It's a, you know, it's not uncommon to find 30 or 40 pounds of it in one spot. And the whole key to chicken mushrooms is finding when they're young and fresh and really juicy. Um, and they're, they actually are surprisingly like chicken when they're cooked. Um, another mushroom that's much harder to find is the cauliflower mushroom over in the corner. And we'll talk about that one a little later. The most common mushroom in the woods are russulas. Russulas are the mushrooms that you just see everywhere. Most of them are red in color, but they could be golden or green or purple. They tend to be very brittle. They have a different cellulose structure. So if you squeeze the stem of the mushroom, it crumbles. Um, most of them, most of them are edible, but a few of them will make you sick. But most people don't don't think much of rustlers. They're kind of underappreciated. You'll often see them kicked over on the side of the trail. And I hear comment by mushroom people of, oh, it's just another rustler, because they're really, really common. Um, Beefsteak mushrooms is uh, this one in the middle. Um, I'm not going to talk about this one a lot because you're not going to see it much, but they're kind of a cool mushroom. When you cut them, it actually looks like a steak. Um, and it can, it's one of the few mushrooms that can be eaten raw, but when you're starting out, you shouldn't eat anything raw until you really know what you're doing. Um, amanitas in the center here, this is a baby amanita. Amanitas are generally really poisonous, so they're the ones you need to learn to avoid when you start out. Um, Bolites are the ones I spoke about earlier with pores under the cap. There's hundreds of varieties of bolites. In fact, somebody just made a set of flashcards of all the bolites of the Northeast, you know, so you can help yourself to learn them. Uh, chanterelles are just one of the most prized mushrooms. You'll find them this time of year out in the woods. In fact, this weekend, we're supposed to get more rain tomorrow. This weekend, I would be shocked if you couldn't find chanterelles out in the woods. Um, wax caps are little very colorful mushrooms, and we'll hit on some of those as we go through. Chicken of the woods. Chicken of the woods is one of the mushrooms that people starting out get the most excited about because they're just spectacular looking mushrooms. They're, the color is incredible. They're the textures and the shape and they can be gigantic. Um, this, this one in the lower right here was a cluster I found that it was so fresh when, we, when I took them off the tree, they were just dripping with, with the moisture and uh, if this was uh, this was Wachusett Mountain. These were on, on the back road in Wachusett Mountain. Um, there's two types of two types of chicken of the woods that you're going to see. One is the sulfurious. This is sulfurious. Sulfurious is um, starts out like this. It starts out like little shells on at the side of a tree. They tend to grow on the sides of the trees and grow out from the trees with one layer on top of another. They're, uh, they're very common. They'll grow any time from late May to early November. And they're very, very big and meaty, but they do grow on the side of the trees. Cincinnatus is one that will grow like a rosette. And it looks like it's growing coming out of the ground, but it's actually growing out of roots um, underground and coming up out of the roots. They're both equally edible. And as with many things, freshness is more important than anything else. The, the younger they are and the more fresh they are, the better they're going to be as far as that ability. These guys tend to soak up a lot of liquid when you cook them. So some people add a little water when they're sauteing them or add a little wine and it keeps them from getting dry as they cook. Um, they like a long, slow cooking time. It's some mushrooms you can really crisp up. This isn't one of them. This is one that you eat in a more softer state. It does have one, one or two lookalikes. The one that you're going to see most commonly in our area is jack-o'-lantern or Omphalata saludens over on the right-hand side here. 
And these two aren't that similar, but when a chicken is really dark orange, it looks almost exactly like this from the top. Um, this one, this one uh, is one that has a couple things to notice about it. It'll make you really incredibly ill if you eat it. It's, you'll be sick for days. But the interesting thing about this mushroom, it's one of the few mushrooms that glows in the dark, which is why it got its name. And you know, people collect a clump of these mushrooms and take them home and go into a dark closet with them to watch them glow. They glow kind of a greenish color in the dark and it's, they have to be very fresh and very uh, kind of juicy like this group here. But uh, it's, it's kind of a neat effect and that's where how the mushroom gets its name. But you definitely don't ever want to eat one of those and you don't want to mistake it for a chicken just because it's orange. And people, you know, people make mistakes all the time. Like there's one, one in the news of somebody who, who picked some really deadly gilled mushrooms and fed them to their guests and had mistaken them for a mushroom that had pores underneath, which really at just a rudimentary glance, you would have known it wasn't the same mushroom, but they were just careless when they were collecting them. So you always have to be very careful. Chanterelles, you know, it's, it's not much, not much uh, bad about chanterelles. They're delicious mushrooms. They tend to be um, very numerous. You can find patches of hundreds of them sometimes if you're lucky. They're not very large in size. The, the golden chanterelles are the most prized ones. They're over on the left here. And in this pic mixed picture of chanterelles up on the right, the, the more egg co yolk color ones are the golden chanterelles. Then these bright orange ones are called cinnabar chanterelles. They're a little smaller in size, but they're also a very good, um, good edible mushroom. And there's other ones, the um, tubiformis here or in the yellow foot that has a, um, a kind of a thinner, thinner stem that's hollow and not, not as meaty as some of the other chanterelles, but there's a lot of them in the woods. And the interesting thing about chanterelles is, as opposed to other mushrooms that appear to have gills, these are not gills. These are actually folds. They're part of the cap of the mushroom. And you can see if you look closely that there's little cross veins going from one to the other that connects them. And there's all these partial, partial splits and stuff that it's very, very distinctive and it will separate them from some of their more dangerous lookalikes. One thing that you often will mistake for a chanterelle is some yellow wax caps. They're not, they're not dangerous. They won't even make you sick, but they're not chanterelles and they don't have any really flavor really. Um, chanterelles, some things to keep in mind, when you find them, they're always growing on soil. They're never growing on wood. If it's growing on wood, it's probably a false chanterelle and probably make you a little bit sick, not a lot. Um, they're single fruit bodies. They don't grow in clusters. Sometimes three or four would be like right next to each other and look like they're growing together, but they're all individual mushrooms. And as I said earlier, they have folds, not gills underneath. So um, all those things will help you to identify chanterelles and they really are, are beautiful mushroom. When you have them in a bag for a little while, a paper bag, and you open it up, it smells almost like apricot. It has a beautiful aroma. Um, one thing to keep in mind when you are collecting mushrooms in the woods, no matter what you're collecting for to ID or to eat or whatever, you shouldn't put them in plastic because especially in hot weather, plastic will make them really decay quickly. You're best off using paper lunch bags or I use um, little wax sandwich bags or a good good medium. Some people even take a roll of sandwich uh, wax paper out in the woods with them and use that. Milk mushrooms, Lactarius, Lactifluus. Milk mushrooms are very common in our area, especially in the summer. You can see this one over here. You can see these droplets coming right off the gills. This is a Lactifluus hygrophoroides, bright orange mushroom. I just found some yesterday, even though it's so dry, they were poking up out of some pine duff. Um, there's three varieties that are very good edibles. They're all kind of orange or burgundy in color. Um, the the uh, Hygrophoides, this one, tends to have gills that are widely spaced like this, orange stem, orange cap, and white, white latex that comes out when you cut it. Um, they're very brittle because they're related to russulas. They're all different colors and sizes. Some of them, like this Lactarius piperatus up in the corner, this one is so intensely hot. It's like putting a drop of hot sauce on your tongue when you touch it. Um, so there's, there's a lot of variations, all different colors. Generally, the orange ones are the ones that are going to be the best in our area. Cauliflower mushroom. If you find one of these, you're really lucky. These are, these are hard to come by, especially when they're young. Um, this, this one over here 
these these three were like perfect perfect mushrooms they tend to associate with red pine so red pine is a good good place to find them um, sometimes old white pine when you cut them open they're chambered like this and they can be very big they can be up like this one I'm holding here this must have been about a 10 pound mushroom um, there's a couple of different varieties but they're all really good edibles and they actually they're one of a few mushrooms that has kind of a sweet flavor to it it's a uh, I, I was cooking a cauliflower mushroom in the kitchen. My son came down and said, oh, you're cooking pancakes? And I said, no, it's a mushroom. Black trumpets. This is one of the choice edibles in our part of the world that people go crazy looking for. And part of the reason is they're so hard to see. Even in the photographs, some of these close-up photographs are even hard to see. They just like look old, dry leaves. They blend right into the background. And you can see over here on the upper right, there's one day we got a whole basket of them. And sometimes when you find black trumpets, you can find an awful lot. And this was, this particular picture up here came from Maine. We were at a, a, a camp up, up in, or a mountain up in Maine. And it was a whole group of us. There's about 40 people on a bus that they let us out on this mountain. And everybody went walking up the mountain looking for mushrooms at the higher elevations. And I decided nobody was looking at the bottom. So I'd look around the base. And I was walking along a trail and I saw about six black trumpets. And went over and picked them. I looked over and there was about another 20 a few feet away. So I went over there and right about that time I was thinking like, geez, I, you know, I had a lot of coffee this morning. I need to find a big tree. So I was, I was looking around for a tree. I went behind this big tree and suddenly looked at the hillside. There must have been a thousand black trumpets for as far as the eye could see. So immediately I started yelling about the black trumpets and the whole crowd gathered and I never got to go to the bathroom for a couple hours still, but we picked trumpets like crazy. We all came back with giant basketfuls. They're delicious. They're fragrant. They smell like butter. They're incredibly good on seafood um, and they dry really well. You could just lay them out on a desk in the sun and they'll be dry in an hour. They're just, and they really preserve well. But black trumpets, once you develop an eye, you'll find them. They're all around. And uh, they're very common in our area in wet summers. This this year we're still finding them, but not as many because it's been so dry. Bolites. Bolites are the mushroom that most people really focus on um, because there's so many of them. They're really interesting and a lot of them are edible. There's very few of them that are dangerous. Um, they all have a cap and a stem. Most of them have pores on the underside of the cap. They can be very large. Sometimes you can find them 12, 15 inches across on the cap. Um, there's a lot of good edibles in this family. As I said earlier, they tend to get buggy in hot weather. A lot of variation in looks. Like, look at this one, the old man of the woods right in the center here. Um, I found this in a sand dune on the Cape, but it's so, it blends in so well that if it was out in the leaves, you'd never see it. Um, most are related to particular types of trees, often oak trees. Um, and some of them, like the Squealis family um, of Bolites, is related more to pines. But three rules for beginners. If you're just starting to try to learn which bolites are edible, the basic rules, and there's a lot of bolites that are edible that break this rule, but if you focus on these three rules when you're starting out, you'll be fairly safe. Um, you want to avoid anything that has a red pore, like this one down here, the um, red or bright orange pore surface underneath is a good sign that it's probably a, not a good one to eat. Um, if you cut it open, it stains blue. Here's one that was only cut open about five seconds when it turned this blue. It had been yellow when it was first cut. Um, blue staining is always a sign of watch out. And bitter taste. A lot of them um, are not poisonous, but are really bitter. And if you mix them in with your other mushrooms, everything will be inedible. This is my favorite bolete. So I made a slide of this one. It's a Bearangia bicolor, the bicolor bolete. Um, they, they tend to have beautiful red color on top, yellow underneath. Um, this is what they look like when they're young. This is what they look like when they're older. The, one of the diagnostic things on these is they don't turn blue quickly when you cut them. Sometimes you'll get a little bit of blue on the underside of the cap when you touch it. But the, the pore layer, the relationship of the size of the pores to the size of the flesh of the mushroom, the flesh of the mushroom is called the context. And so the pore layer is extremely thin on bicolor bolides. Oops, click the slide. And so it's extremely thin, which is a good diagnostic tool. 
and the coloration, the stem has this kind of red speckling over a yellow background. They're really just pretty, pretty mushrooms. When they're young, they're kind of velvety looking. Here's some other types of boletes. Many boletes are identified by what's called reticulation on the stem or netting kind of pattern. Over on the right is a frost bolete, which is called the candy apple bolete because it's so bright red and has this uh, red reticulation on the stem. This is a mushroom that has red pores and stains blue and is still edible. So like I said, some break the rules. Um, Dornotopes over here is a yellow reticulation on the stem. Russell's bolete has a really shaggy stem. But this is the one you always want to keep an eye out for. This particular mushroom I found at the Tully Campground one year. Um, this is Boletus edulis. Um, it's a whole group of mushrooms. This particular one is called Porcini or Penny Bun. And it has white reticulation on the upper stem, which is sometimes very hard to see. You got to get in close. But this is really one of the prime edible mushrooms out there. Puffballs. People are kind of intrigued by puffballs. The giant puffballs, you can find puffballs up to 50 pounds. People always tend to try to get a picture of a small dog with a big puffball. And uh, the general rule on puffballs, if they're bigger than a softball and they're white inside and firm, they're fine. You don't have to worry about it. Smaller puffballs, you have to be more careful. And you should always cut them open. There's two things you're looking out for. Here's, a, here's pyroform over here, which is a puffball that grows on wood in big clusters. And these are edible puffball. The big guys are really, they're great for making like chicken parmesan. You can slice them and batter them and fry them and then use them in parmesan. They're really great. Um, but here's the things to look out for, dangerous lookalikes. If you cut it open and it's black inside, or even if it's green or yellow and not pure white like this, stay away. It's either too old or a deadly earth ball. This is Scleroderma citrinum. has kind of a brown bumpy exterior and it's grayish black on the inside. Make you really sick. You don't want to go near these. And sometimes it's not a puff ball at all. Here's an Amanita egg that has a little baby Amanita inside. So when you cut it open, you can see the mushroom in there and you know it's not a puff ball. But other than that, puffballs, uh, you know, you, often the problem is figuring out what to do with all the puffball you have. This is one of my personal favorites. Really hard to find, but this is the time of year you would find it. The lobster mushroom. Um, lobster mushroom is not even a type of mushroom. It's actually a rustla or a lactarius variety, which is a white mushroom. And it's usually one that's not one of the edible ones. It, it's usually really a hot and spicy one or just a bad tasting one but it gets attacked by another fungus that forms this orange layer on it and it becomes an incredibly good edible and it's really, it transforms the taste and the texture, everything about it just changes. And usually when you find one lobster mushroom, there's more around, so you need to dig around in the leaves, but they come out midsummer to early fall and this is the time of year where you find them. When they're young like this and um, bright orange, they're, they're delicious mushrooms. When they get really dark like this, sometimes they're getting past their prime. And people actually use these to dye fabrics because they have such a beautiful color. Then we come to the fall. The fall is when we're really in peak season for mushrooms. So I'm going to, you know, I could spend two hours talking about fall mushrooms, but I'm just going to give you a little tasting of some of the more common ones you're going to see. Um, we have a whole mix here in the center. We have oyster mushrooms. Um, down below is Hen of the Woods, which is one of the real favored ones everybody loves. We have Matsutake. Matsutake tend to be more rare in our area. They tend to like to grow on like sandy seashores, but I have found them, I have found them in Royalston. I found them in Orange and Athol. They do grow in the area. They associate with hemlocks usually. Um, this is a weird one, the aborted entoloma. It's a regular cap and stem mushroom that something happens to when it comes out and turns into this strange lumpy thing that almost looks like a shrimp. And one of the common names of it is a uh, shrimp of the woods. And it's a delicious mushroom. It has a nutty flavor and it's really, you can get huge numbers of them in early fall after a rainstorm. Uh, lion's mane is another choice edible. This grows on old beach primarily and it looks like just white icicles and it tastes like seafood and uh, has a texture like scallops kind of. Um, down the corner here, bluets, really late, late mushroom that come out usually after the first frost. Um, really cool looking, delicious purple mushroom. Um, brick tops in the lower right over here, just growing fantastically numerous clusters on old stumps. 
and uh, you can get just hundreds and hundreds from one spot. Same with honey mushrooms over in the corner. And up in the upper right is something called the fall oyster, which is a disgusting looking green mushroom that grows on wood. Um, but throw it in boiling water for a couple seconds and it turns golden color and it's just a delicious edible. Oyster mushrooms. These guys are pretty easy to identify. In the lower left-hand corner, you see what they look like when they're really young. Um, they just have these little caps with, with the strong decurrent gills. When the gills come down the stem, they're called decurrent. Um, here's your typical Proartis ostriatus and it's a very young stage, it's almost pure white. Um, but you can find them really dark brown as it gets later in the fall. These were collected in December, the little ones in the corner. You can see the caps are much browner. Here's a typical kind of grayish color. You'll see them in big clusters, usually on old maple trees on the side of the road, like this one over on the, on the right-hand side. And then the fall oyster down in the corner there. Honey mushrooms. Honey mushrooms are intensely parasitic mushroom. They kill the trees, but they are delicious, so don't feel guilty about eating them. Um, honey mushrooms, you boil them for about half a minute, gets rid of some mild toxins they often have on the outside, and they're very good to eat. Um, but you can get these in just numerous, numerous places around our area because they're very common. They grow in big clusters at the base of trees. This is what they look like when they're really young. This is what they look like when they're really old. And I found honey mushrooms that have caps eight inches across, but they're best when they're kind of little buttons like this and haven't really opened up. And these, these over here were still fine. They were still edible, but they were a little bit past their peak. Lion's mane, hericium, like I mentioned earlier, this is a, not only is it delicious and um, tastes like seafood, but it also has medicinal properties. This is, this is pure white when it's at its peak. As it gets a little older, it gets yellow. When you find one like this, it's a little bit past its prime, but you're going to find them primarily on old beech trees and um, beech trees with damaged areas. Hen of the Woods. Hen of the Woods is one that people get the most excited about because as you can see my friend Bill over here, this is a picture from Royalston up by Lake Tully. Um, these these uh, hen of the woods tend to grow at the base of old oak trees and we were out in the hemlock area and we saw this big big oak tree down at the bottom of a ravine so we went down and looked behind it and sure enough there was this massive hen of the woods. We tried to weigh it but it was too big to get on a scale so we tried breaking it in half and best we could estimate was about 45 to 50 pounds and it was fresh and delicious. They had just come up. They had grown in maybe three days to that size. When they're young they look something like this. Here's top and bottom in the, in the middle at the lower part. They're usually white underneath and they're anywhere from light beige to almost black on the top. And they just grow in these big clusters and they're really, they're great. You can, you can break the little petals off, lay them on a pan, just put some oil and spices on them and throw them in an oven at like 400 degrees, 450, and let them roast till they're crispy and they're delicious. And they dry really well to use over the winter. Most people have big jars of of uh, Hen of the Woods. I, I, uh, you can see uh, up in, I don't know if this will show up on the camera, but here's a jar of some bicolor bolites that I just collected and dried earlier this season. I love drying bicolor bolites because they get a beautiful smell after they dry. Um, these things smell like almond butter. What do you do when you have too many mushrooms? You know, sometimes you're really faced with the dilemma. You come home, you're tired from a whole day in the woods, and you have so many mushrooms, you don't know what to do with them. You know, up, up in the upper right, this was one day on Mount Monadnock, and this is, these mushrooms are covering the, the top of my stove. They were, they were just piled like eight inches high across the whole stove, and I was just looking at it going, my God, how will I ever clean these out? And, uh, but you know, I did. And here's my friend Nick with a big puff ball debating what he's gonna do with it. Well, you can always cook them. There's a lot of ways to preserve them and cook them. Um, cooking wild mushrooms, you know, you want to make sure you always cook them thoroughly. As I mentioned earlier, it can be dangerous to eat undercooked wild mushrooms. Um, you could saute and pan fry them just with a little oil. I tend to put a tiny bit of oil in the pan, throw the mushrooms in, get, get them nice and hot, and they will release a bunch of liquid. The liquid fills up the pan, then crank up the heat to kind of burn off the liquid and brown them up quickly. You don't want them to just sit in the liquid for a long time. You can roast them in the oven. You can put them on the grill. 
Um, if you're going to freeze mushrooms to save over the winter, it's best to cook them first, especially with some liquid or some butter, and then freeze them already cooked. They'll hold up much better and be much safer. Um, you can also dry them. I use dehydrators. I will hang them in the sun. Just get them good and dry and put them in airtight jars. It's, it's a nice thing to take them and, uh, and put them in the freezer for a little while after you dry them to make sure you get rid of any kind of um, bacteria that might be on them. Down in the lower right here, you can see one of my favorite dishes, swordfish with black trumpets on it. They dehydrate really well. You can use them through the whole winter. My father-in-law just turned 98 years old, but he's still cooking up a storm. When you're collecting mushrooms, size it and everything. It's, uh, you know, you get excited by a big mushroom, but sometimes the youngest mushrooms are the tastiest, the best, and the cleanest. Uh, Although this, this mushroom, me holding up in the middle, was the first lobster mushroom I ever found. And I was really excited, but it was like a fisherman holding up his catch. You got to get it right up close to the camera so it looks gigantic. This is Ziggy. He comes on a lot of the walks with us. Other things you can use wild mushrooms for. There's a, you know, medicinal uses. A lot of them can be made into tinctures. Um, Ganoderma is one of the ones you'll see in the woods a lot around us. I saw these. I was up at um, Gifford Memorial Forest up in, uh, I think it's probably Royalston just yesterday, and there was a bunch of these growing on the trees. They're used to make uh, tinctures, and you can't eat them because they're really hard, but um, they're powdered and dried, and they even sell them in health food stores. It's, it's like daily, daily um, supplements. Uh, turkey tails, this is, these are kind of old green moldy ones, but it was just kind of a cool picture. Um, turkey tails are another really medicinal one. A lot of them have anti-tumor properties. People also collect a lot of different kinds of mushrooms to use to dye fabrics. And I'm, I'm not an expert on dyeing fabrics, but um, you know they do break down with different mordants to get them ready to use on fabrics. This is a, a cinnabar polypore, which is one that just really is prized for its dyeing potential. It really allows, allows a lot of color to come through. Get to know Amanitas. They're very, very poisonous. Uh, for the most part, there's there's a couple that are edible, but when you're starting out, nobody eats amanitas. Some of the things that are common in amanitas is when they're young, they tend to be kind of stout with a lot of patches or pieces of the universal veil left on the cap. They tend to be some of the biggest mushrooms in the woods. Like here's some big amanitas I collected, and they were so so full of spores. Like when I put them down, my hands were white from all the spores dripping off them. In the center, this is the destroying angel. It looks like a nice white mushroom when it's young. It looks just like the button mushrooms on the store. One of these mushrooms will kill you. They're really <coughs> highly, highly toxic. Amanitas generally are tall in stature. They're, they're generally bigger mushrooms, big caps. They often have a flaring ring um, on the upper part of the stem. And there's, there's just a lot of them in our woods. You'll always find amanitas, and you should always avoid them for eating and get to know amanitas. They're the most common deadly mushroom you're going to see. There's a lot of weird stuff out there. <clears throat> you get out in the woods, you never know what you might find. You have up in the upper corner is jelly funguses. Here's some puff balls. The lower left, this is a calistoma. Its common name is hot lips because when you look from the top, this part looks like a pair of pink lips. There's coral mushrooms that really look like sea coral. Um, this, is a, this is a bolete that's parasitic. Um, it only grows on poison puffballs, but the bolete is edible and, and just delicious, but nobody can explain how it's growing out of this poison mushroom. It comes out to be perfectly safe. Um, here's a stink horn or the phallus group there. You won't miss these if they're in the woods because it just smells like a rotting corpse. If you ever smell the rotting corpse, I haven't, but now I know what they smell like thanks to these. A um, couple more things. Here's some sources. I don't know if you can screen share this, or but a couple things to think about if you're trying to learn ID and you don't have a club nearby. I gave the link to the Boston Mycological Club down in the lower left. But on the internet, there's a lot of bad information out there, but a couple of the sites that are very reliable. One is mushroomexpert.com, Michael Kuo, who's an English teacher from the Midwest. He has a fantastic site, and it also teaches you a lot about tree associations and stuff like that. Mushroom Observer is more just a lot of it's eye candy where it's a lot of different mushrooms that people 
have uh, put pictures up, up online from all over. Um, in the center is a picture of this set of flashcards that just came out, the Myco cards. Um, and then over on the right are some great beginner books. Um, the Complete Mushroom Hunter by Gary Linkoff, probably the best book you could start out with because it's simple, easy to digest, has a lot of good information. Um, and then there's a few others that focus on uh, mushrooms of the Northeast. And some are small, you can fit them in your pocket to take out in the woods. Other ones are kind of bigger and meatier. This, these are all great mushrooms, mushroom books to have in your library. And, and one thing you got to realize, there's thousands and thousands of types of mushrooms out there. So when somebody goes to make a mushroom book, they have to pick and choose. And even if they have five or 600 photographs of mushrooms in a book, that's just the tip of the iceberg. So they really have to spend a lot of time deciding which ones to put in. So when you get to a family like Russellas, there's hundreds and hundreds of Russellas. Most books have three or four. And so it's very hard to get information on some of these to just figure out what you found in the woods because the books don't cover them in enough, um, enough depth. So you have to have several books to really get a good coverage of what's out there. And that kind of, that kind of finishes up what I have to present today, but I know there's questions and stuff like that. So I'm gonna um, shut off the show and we'll see if we have some questions. Great, thank you so much, David. That was very informative and I learned a lot about mushrooms. Um, so I've been taking um, tabs of questions. And so I think, um, Someone asked about a good recommendation for a book. So I think uh, that last slide you sent, uh, you showed is what they were looking for. Yeah. Um, and just a, uh, I put it in the chat, but we will be sending the link to the webinar recording okay, good. Yeah. Um, to all the participants. And this will also be available to the public on our website and if uh, hopefully David can figure out how to send me that last slide and yeah, that will also be included. I'll figure it out, yeah. Okay. Um, so do you wanna start with, with chats or questions or what's easier? So what uh, we're gonna do is I'm gonna start reading out the questions and then you can answer them. And if okay. you have any others, uh, please feel free to type it in. We'll try to get to as many as we can. Okay. Okay, so uh, first question is, does chaga have a symbiotic relationship with birch trees? And if you pick it, will it damage the tree? Yes and no. Um, yes, it's definitely with birch trees. Just to backtrack a little, chaga, I, I kind of skipped over it because I couldn't find a good picture of chaga. Every time I find chaga, I end up getting excited and forget to take a picture. But um, Chaga is one of these things that grows in the woods that you're really never going to know it's a mushroom until you start to learn what it is. It grows in about one in 500 birch trees. And so it's not really common, but it's the height of medicinal mushrooms. And it looks like a big chunk of burnt wood when you find it. And the outside is black and hard as a rock. The interior is kind of an orange color. And it usually grows out of a damaged part of the tree, like a part where a limb's broken off or a big, a big knot hole. Um, they can be gigantic. You can get chagas 50, 60 pounds, but they, they will not really um, damage the tree to remove it as long as you're careful and just kind of take off the chaga and don't rip off the tree with it, you know, it's, um, but they're very hard. So usually you have to kind of pry it off and they're used primarily where they use it a lot for tea. It makes a really nice tea. I grind it just with a grinder. And, uh, and let it steep in hot water and it makes an excellent tea. The, the common lore is that chaga um, cures cancer. It's supposed to have all kinds, it's basically snake oil for everything. It just, it's the ultimate medicinal mushroom. It's supposed to have all kinds of medicinal benefits. Very hard to document much of it. It's, most of it's anecdotal. And part of the anecdotal lore of chaga is that it's best if collected in the fall from an active living tree. Um, and it, it is going to be on birch. And I found it all around Athol, Royalston, Orange, all this area. There's a lot of chaga up here. Um, so you can find it. And it's a good time of year to find it. And if you find it on a dead tree, don't bother collecting it because it will taste bad and supposedly doesn't have any medicinal value. But the problem is a lot of the, the medicinal mushrooms, there's not much research on it because it's this interrelationship of the environment, the mushrooms, the tree are all 
combining together to create this medicinal effect. And the drug companies can't really separate one thing and get rid of all the rest. So they can't reproduce it. So there's no money in it. So there's no research going into it. So it's very limited amount of research out there. Someone else asked, are there lookalikes for beliefs? Not, not really if you're careful because um, the, the bolites are a wide family. So there's bolites you don't want to eat. They're dangerous that are lookalikes for edible bolites, but they're all bolites. Um, the, oh, one of the few things that looks like a bolete that is not edible or is dangerous is the, um, uh, it's something called tapanellus or the velvet foot. And they look just like a bolete from the top and they grow out of wood you'll find them and once you turn it over though, it has gills and it has a fuzzy brown stem. And so you'll know right away it's not a bolete when you turn it over. There are a few gilled bolites, but all the gilled bolites have, uh, have kind of a velvety red cap and bright yellow gills. Great. Uh, another question is, are mushrooms poisonous to animals? And if so, can they tell which ones are safe to eat? No. Um, the mushrooms, they may be poisonous to animals. We don't really know for sure. I mean, there's certainly some that would kill any animal, including your pet dog or a squirrel that eats it. But, you know, a lot of times people see a mushroom that's chewed in the woods and they assume, well, if animals are eating it, it's got to be safe. Um, animals have a different digestive system. Some of them can eat things we couldn't even come close to digesting and surviving. Um, but more importantly, you see a mushroom that's out in the woods that's been chewed on. You don't know if there's a squirrel laying dead somewhere in the forest. You know, it's, it's really, we have no, no, no data to know whether or not um, a mushroom is safe because some animal eats it, whether it's safe for you. So some of the common myths are people say, if you put a silver spoon in, in a cup of water with a mushroom and it turns color, it's kind of, it turns black, the mushroom is poison. Or there's a lot of folklore out, out there about how to easily tell if a mushroom is poison. And it's all just folklore, really. None of it's none of it's safe to get, rely on. Okay, good to know. Um, someone asked, um, I have a lot of Amanita muscaria inside yard. What are some uses for these? Well, the, the Siberian um, indigenous people use them to go on magical trips. And that's supposedly where flying reindeer have come from. But uh, Muscaria in our area is kind of an orange color, but it is the classic mushroom you see red with the white spots. And um, there are a lot of uh, a lot of indigenous people, especially in the far north, that use it as part of religious ceremonies. And, and they do have psychoactive properties, but the ones in our area have very limited psychoactive properties and really a lot of toxic properties. So you're more likely to get more sick than more happy if you ever eat them. And, um, not a good idea, especially in our area, but there's really not many uses for them. Um, it's the common names fly agaric because supposedly if you put them in, in a bowl of water, flies will be attracted and die, you know, <laughs> but, but that's, you know, that, that's probably folklore too. I don't know how much of that is true, but they're unfortunate, big, beautiful mushrooms, but there's not really much you can do with them. They're, they're, uh, they're not, they're not something you want to try eating and people do, boil them for endless amounts of time and keep changing the water. Supposedly it makes them safe eventually to eat, but after you've boiled anything enough times, there's really not much flavor left to begin with. And it's just kind of a slimy mess. So I, you know, I would, I would just enjoy them for their beauty and not, not think about trying to eat those. Great. Um, so what tools do you bring to harvest some of these larger mushrooms? So you should, I, you know, I have a, a bag that I bring along with me. It just has tons of stuff. But the, you know, the main thing if I'm just kind of running out into the woods is I'll have some wax bags, and I'll have a good mushroom knife that's a folding knife that closes with a brush on the end, so I can brush dirt off the mushroom before I take it. Um, if I'm collecting something to eat, I will cut off the base of it if I know what it is, um, and just brush off all the dirt and then put it into the wax bag. I, you know. There's other tools you can bring, like when it's, when, if I'm going out in the woods and looking for lion's mane in a beech forest, they tend to sometimes grow really high up on the trees. So some people bring a telescoping apple picker, which is like a little basket 
that goes up to like 16 feet so you can knock things off high branches and and so you know people have all kinds of things they bring along with them but usually just a good knife a basket to put your mushrooms in some wax bags and other things i bring in the woods i bring a little scope a little magnifier so if i want to get a close look at the stem to see if there's reticulation i can use that or look at the pores um, but I don't bring much more than that. You know, my phone has an adequate camera on it, so I stop bringing the camera along and bring lots of off and, you know, make sure um, you're, you're well protected for ticks. So are oysters on live trees? Yeah, usually they're killing the tree. Um, so they are, they are a, a parasite that's, that does a number on a tree pretty fast. I, I think generally a tree that sports a lot of oysters is probably less than 10 years left on the planet. You know, they're going to, they're going to just kind of eat up that tree pretty quickly. And the oysters actually eat other insects too. They kind of, uh, not only, not only do they eat the tree, but they eat little nematodes and other insects that come into contact with them. They send out, I've seen microscopic pictures. They send out something that looks like a little lasso that goes around the little tiny, tiny larvae and just, and circles them and pulls them into the mushroom and they eat it. So you don't have to feel guilty about eating oyster mushrooms or eating everything in their path. Do you know about fairy circles? And if so, can you tell us a little bit about those? Yeah, ge generally um, fairy circles are a common thing. They were, they were a big thing in the middle ages because people thought it was like demons dancing at night would cause these mushrooms to grow in the morning. Um, and it's basically, you'll see a lot on lawns of a complete circle of mushrooms. And some types of mushrooms are very prone to growing this way. And what you're really seeing is the mycelium is the actual organism under the ground. And mushrooms are coming up on the outer edge of it. So this circle of mushrooms is just the outline of the mycelium that's under the soil. And uh, so, so fairy ring mushrooms, which is the common name of, of uh, Myriasmus uh, oreades, which is a lawn mushroom, is a great little edible mushroom um, and it will come up on lawns in big fairy circles. You got 50 or 60 of them in a big circle on the lawn. One thing to keep in mind though is if you're collecting mushrooms to eat, you want to think about the environment too. Is this a lawn that's really beautifully manicured and there's no weeds and everything looks really healthy? You don't want to eat a mushroom off a lawn like that. You want to eat a mushroom off a lawn that looks ratty with some weeds and dead spots because that's a lawn that doesn't have a lot of chemicals on it. The ones that look too green and healthy are probably full of herbicides and fertilizers and everything else. And you don't want to be eating that kind of stuff. So I pass on, like right now, my neighborhood is full of uh, agaricus campestri, which is pretty much the same as little white button mushroom from the grocery store. And they're all over the place, but they're only on the lawns that are full of fertilizer and chemicals. They're just, they're enjoying that fertilizer and they're coming up like crazy. But Every, every ratty lawn doesn't have any, like my lawn is ratty and it doesn't have any mushrooms right now. So it's, uh, it's just the fertilizer base and the irrigation system to kind of get those going. Okay, uh, very important. Don't eat mushrooms from places that could have herbicides or pesticides on it. Yeah. Um, another question, uh, do you know of any good free apps for mushroom ID? There's, um, Actually, it's only for an iPhone, but there's one out there called Mushroom Log, L-O-G. And it's not free, but it's so cheap, it might as well be free. I think it's like $4.99 or something. And um, it, it's, it's probably the best app out there. And it kills me because it's only for Apple. I don't have an Apple phone, so I don't use it, but a lot of my friends do. And it basically will, um, it will allow you to leave a breadcrumb trail wherever you go for a walk. So if you're going for a walk in the woods, you can type in say I'm walking the Tully Trail and it will leave a mark it will show a map of the area leave a mark of where you've walked each time you see a mushroom you can click on that spot it'll leave a GPS marker on that spot on your system and it will tell you you found mushrooms there then it will give you a box you can scroll down you find the mushroom and and lock in a picture of it so when you come back there the next year you'll have a whole map of what you found where. Now it's not gonna be just show a mushroom to your camera, it's gonna tell you what it is. It's, it's just way more complicated than that. So there's not really a good app that can do that at this point. Um, but there are apps that will help you like that and will help you not get lost in the woods too. And one thing that I didn't mention that is really 
something that's kind of like mushroom hunters know and you learn over time is that these mushrooms are extremely sensitive as far as time. Many mushrooms come up the same exact day every year. And so once you get to know you found a great mushroom on this tree on September 30th, in the back of your mind, September 30th is going to come. You're going to be heading to check that tree. And before you know it, you might be heading to check 20 trees in one day because they're all good trees for that day. You know, and you start to get this giant inventory of your, in your head. And some mushrooms like Hen of the Woods are really particular. They're going to show up on the same trees every year and usually almost to the day. I have mushrooms that I judge the season by um, when they show up. I have train records in my neighborhood would show up on May 15th every year, but this year everything was a little bit late, so they showed up May 18th. Um, and, you know, one year, one year everything was really late. They went as far as like May 28th, but that's the biggest window I've ever seen. And, and you know, most of these mushrooms are, are, it's strange how accurate they are as far as they come back the same time every year. Well, that is a great lead up to my next question. Someone yeah. asked, I found some chicken of the woods three years ago on a log and it has not come back since. How come? Well, when it's on a fallen log like that, eventually the nutritional value of the log gets kind of used up. And so the mushroom doesn't have enough, enough uh, food to kind of bring it back again. You know, it's on a living tree, it's a little different because um, they may kill the tree eventually and then you won't see the mushroom anymore. But on a log, eventually a log gets decayed to the point where it doesn't support them. And it's also the whole thing I just said about them coming back to the same spot every year, the conditions have to be right. Um, so in other words, when I, one year it was really dry in September and I went and checked all my hen trees that come out in September and none of them had hens because it was just too dry, couldn't produce any mushrooms. But then when I got to the trees that come out in October, we got rain in October and they all had hens, all the trees that should have had hens, you know. So um, the conditions have to support a mushroom. So it could be also a weather condition if the log's still kind of able to produce mushrooms. If there wasn't enough moisture, it may not produce them. Makes sense. Okay, so we got a little more context about Learn Your Land. It is apparently a YouTube channel run by Adam Harrington in Pennsylvania and he teaches mushroom identification on oh, okay. it. Okay, yeah, there's, I mean, there's there's tons of stuff like that out there, tons, just tons of it. And, and it's uh, like on, on the BMC now, the Boston Club, we've been doing, um, we, we've done tons of Zoom lectures all through the spring and into the summer. And lately we've been trying to do virtual forays where, where a club member, two members will walk out into the woods and just film the whole thing. and and you know, film what you find and talk about the different mushrooms you come across and just do real kind of walks in the woods. And uh, you know, some are set to music and they're edited so there's not a lot of walking time with no mushrooms. And, um, but you know, there, there's a lot of stuff out there and Pennsylvania has some great mushrooms. It's uh, Western Pennsylvania has a really active mushroom club with a lot of people, but there's stuff much closer to home. You know, one of, one of the leading experts in the entire country is right up in the Athol area, uh, Noah Siegel who's written books and, you know, is really, really well known. And uh, although unfortunately he's not in the area a lot, he travels all over the place. He just recently had a book on mushrooms of the West Coast and the Redwood Forest. So he's, uh, you know, he's all over the place, but he's, he's kind of known nationally as one of the best photographers and the best, you know, mycological ID guys around. Very cool. Okay, so two last questions and then we'll wrap it up. Um, are there any toxic mushrooms that should not be touched? Should gloves be used when mushroom hunting? Not really, no. It's, a, <clears throat> it's kind of a myth. And uh, there's a recent book that just came out on Amanitas. And up till now, I've always told people, don't put Amanitas in the same basket that you're going to put your edible mushrooms because, you know, the spores could brush off on them. And I still tell people that. But this book insists that's not the case, that they've, you know, tested the toxicity of the spores and it's so light that if you got some spores on another mushroom, it's not going to affect you. Um, I would play it safe and if you're collecting edible mushrooms and poisonous mushrooms at the same time to keep them separate, put them in separate bags. But um, certainly touching them is not going to be a problem at all. I mean, you don't want to touch them and lick your fingers afterwards, but, um, you know, just 
use normal precautions if it's a poisonous mushroom, but you know, you can handle it. You may even be able to nibble a little bit, you know, and spit it out. It's not going to hurt you to do that, but you really, you really, you know, don't want to go rubbing your eyes afterwards or anything like that. Okay. So kind of similar with COVID. <laughs> yeah. You kind of treat it like off, you know, you don't want to rub your eyes or stick your fingers in your mouth after you spray off either. You know? Yes. Okay. And then the last question is, how do you sustainably harvest mushrooms that grow in the soil? Easy. You just harvest the fruiting body. Um, because that's, that's the common fallacy of people think that harvesting mushrooms is going to hurt the mushroom and it's going to make them not come back. Now, in a plant like ramps, which we see in the springtime, the wild leek, the wild onion, you know, it's, it's, if you take that, the bulb is the whole plant, you're taking the entire plant or the Indian cucumber, you're taking the whole plant. But when you take the mushroom, the mushroom is this big net under the ground and you're only taking the fruiting body. So you're not, you're not harming the actual organism and it's still going to be there unaffected. It's kind of like you can compare it to picking apples off a tree. So, you know, you're not hurting the tree to pick the apples. And a lot of people, you know, kind of more of the belief that picking the mushrooms helps the fruiting body because it doesn't have to put all that energy into supporting producing this mushroom and the energy goes somewhere. So it's going to go into growing the actual web under the soil to a stronger degree, you know, and, and so it's it's one of the topics that people talk about in, in you know mushroom hunting does it hurt the mushroom does it not and i firmly the belief it doesn't hurt it um but some people some people are more skeptical about it but i i think you know it's only it's only the fruit it's not you're not really picking the mushroom great well thank you for all of the questions and for the 40 participants that stayed even almost 20 minutes after um, the set time. Um, we will be sending um, the link to the recording and the uh, resources guide. Yeah, I'll get you that frame and send it over. Yes, we'll be sending that out uh, as soon as we have it all. So look at that, look out for that in your email. Um, and it'll also be on our, our website, our YouTube channel. So thank you, everyone. Uh, have a great night. Yeah, thank you for having me. It was a lot of fun. Thank you so much, David. Hope to see you in the woods. <laughs>